We have become a society that has put our lives out online. We share things on Facebook. We tweet what we had for breakfast. We've put a ton of things online. We share publicly. Frankly, we share some things that were done in public that perhaps shouldn't be shared in public. We've got students now who are opening up different Facebook accounts. There's the ones for their friends, and then there's the ones that employers in the future might see. We have people paring down their friends list only to their genuine friends because they realize that things are getting shared beyond the borders that they should be. We have parties that are photo free. Check your cell phone at the door. You may not take photos at this party. Purely aimed at a target audience that adding a little alcohol and indiscretion, things get posted that shouldn't be posted. So a company that got ahead of this, Norte Beer. It's a, it's a beer company in Argentina. And so they invented a beer sleeve and it's called Photo Blocker. And what this does is that as soon as a cell phone puts off a bit of a flash that it's going to take a photo, it emits a large blast of light, which essentially makes any photo about to be captured useless. <laughs> Think about the applications in a nightclub. Think about the applications in a restaurant. So I'm going to play for you a video of how this, thing's work, this thing works. Now, it's from 2011, but I still think it's a fabulous, fabulous insight because they, as a company, got on the side of the consumer. Think about that. Think about it from the consumer standpoint. Let's take a look. 2011. Technological advances and social networks can now turn a night out into hell. Divorce. You floozy. You're fired. Dirty old man. That's why Norte Beer presents Photo Blocker, the first beer cooler that detects when a photo is being taken and shines a flash, keeping you safe and sound. Norte Photo Blocker. What happens in the club stays in the club. They got on the side of the consumer. They recognized this trend for wanting to go private in public. Now, don't interpret it as... Um, uh, a rejection of technology. It's far from that. In fact, what it is is simply wanting to take technology into your own hands. Another example of a company that has, has utilized this is KitKat. They created something called the Wi-Fi Free Zone. Okay, have a break, have a KitKat. They created an area where you could sit down, enjoy a break without a device. It had a blocker, so you couldn't sit there, mm, do this, sitting beside people, you actually had to engage in a conversation, okay? It really made sense for their brand because of course, you know, have a break, have a Kit Kat is all part of their positioning, okay? They were able to get on side. But, here's, here's the big but. What is the ethical application of predictive analytics? Predictive analytics is this stuff that all of these companies are accumulating. You probably are accumulating it on some of your customers as well. How often they visit the site, what they're tweeting, who they're sharing with. Anyone completed a BuzzFeed quiz lately? Mm, okay. Wow, nobody wants to admit it. That's great, because I know that there's some in this room who have done it. Okay, fair enough. We are collecting a ton of data. Frankly, we are a big social experiment right now. We are collecting things, we're utilizing tools, information on people that allows us to do things that we probably shouldn't, but we can, and there are no rules. It's a bit of a wild west because the internet is not really owned by anybody, not really regulated by anybody. We can do stuff. So as a company, we need to kind of do a bit of a check-in. What should we do, not what could we do? And making sure that connects with our customer. Now, I'm going to share with you a bit of a, a, bit of a personal example. My mother was in hospital, uh, Lionsgate Hospital, in January. She's almost 90. Um, she lives independently. She had some complications of diabetes, high blood pressure. 
Uh, long story short, she was in there for four weeks, going on five weeks. Advocate daughter decided it was time to break mum free and get her supported in, in home in the community. Not an easy thing. Great care in the hospital, not as easy to get things set up at home, especially when you've become insulin dependent. So after having one of these meetings, there's eight kind of medical, good meeting, medical people, all well meeting, sitting around the table and me, uh, very, very emotional. We're talking about, you know, maybe some care, all the cognitive assessments. And all I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I just need to get her out of here. I just need to see what normal looks like again. So I stepped away from the meeting and I took a break. Okay, I thought, I checked my email because it's in the middle of the day and I went on Facebook because there had been some neat discussions. You know, I'm going to escape. I'm going to have some fun on Facebook. And in the middle of my Facebook feed at that exact moment showed up this. Okay, uh, it's from Kessel Care, BC's most compassionate home care for your loved ones. Now on some level, this was a, you know, a decent message, right? It would... It potentially was useful for me, but what it really got me thinking about was, oh my God, how did they, like, why did this show up now? And it immediately cast me back into, ugh, ugh, I have not escaped anymore. I stepped away to escape, bam, I've been hit on it again. It's like I'm being tracked, and I think I actually was potentially being a bit tracked. I've since turned my location off on my phone, I don't know if it was tied into the GPS that I was in Lionsgate at that time. Could be. I had certainly talked on Facebook about my mum being in hospital. Had they combed my messages? I find that a bit creepy. Okay. It's possible that they simply bought females 45 to 65 in BC or Vancouver, knowing full well that there's a good chance you might be caring for an elderly parent. That is entirely possible. But I'm really troubled. I'm troubled at how this showed up at that exact moment. For me, this is far too personal. This hit me the wrong way. For other companies, or another person, this might have been a welcome message. And, and that's the point I want to make with this, is you have to think about where this is going to be received. You can do sponsored content in Facebook. You can do this kind of stuff location-based. All of this is possible, but does it make sense? How is it going to be received? I've yet to have anyone from Kessel Care in a presentation when I do this, but I would love to have somebody tell me the back end of the story. So going private in public is a big trend. And I'd invite you from the sales side is to consider what you can do and what you should do in terms of making those connections with your potential customers. Word of mouth has been with us since the beginning of time. We love to share things. We love to share stories. It is more than 10 times more effective than advertising. Think about that for a minute. Instead of paying to get your message spread, it can be 10 times more effective by getting someone to talk about you, okay, in person and online. That's powerful. If you can become part of that conversation, all of a sudden you are that much more potentially successful in terms of being able to connect with that customer and sell. So why is word of mouth so powerful? It's all about trust and it's all about targeting. Think about it. We trust our friends. We trust them to share with us stuff that we should, we should know about. It's also targeted. They tend to share what we will want to hear about. Okay? Trust and targeting are like the best sifter. Our friends will share with us what we need to know. So back in, was it December, Nelson Mandela died? Um, and I found myself reflecting back. I, I went back and I rewatched this movie, Power of One. Anyone, anyone watched Power of One back in, was it the 80s? It was set in a, uh, apartheid in, in South Africa, um, post-World War II. And it really got me thinking about the notion of the power of one to influence the power of many. But what I started thinking about was, okay, is it really one to many? Or is it one to one to many? And the more I thought about that, I thought, no, it's the power of one to one to many. Because I can, if I'm going to get my message shared around, I need to get you 
to share it with your friends. Okay? So I need to give Jay here something that she wants to share with her circles, and then it will go to her many. So framed from that perspective, it's not about you, it's about them. Okay? This is a really, really critical one, especially for businesses that are, oh my God, I'm gonna use social media, I'm gonna tweet, I'm gonna tell them all about our authors, I'm gonna, you know, we got a great new, you know, a new product. Yeah, that's all about you. So make it about them. So back to the old, um, you know, the feature benefit thing. Yeah, that's our feature, but what are we, what's the benefit here? So frame it from the customer's perspective. What are they able to get as a benefit? And frame it from that, that angle. So give them something that make them look smart, funny, insightful, connected in some way to an inner circle. To me, that seems to be the, the secret sauce to getting people to talk about your brand or share information online. Make them seem funny. Jay wants to be funny to her friends. Right? Um, Carolyn wants to be seen as on the inner circle. I know something that you don't know. I'm seen as insightful in some way. Okay? Framed from that perspective, it all of a sudden makes sense. Now, here's an example. Ren Clothing. They did a really interesting viral campaign. Came out this spring, it was in March, and it was called First Kiss. This was a piece of amazing content marketing. And you're probably going to hear the buzz about content marketing. It's all about not blatantly branding your message, but having it appear sort of in natural context. Okay. Ren Clothing is out of LA. Uh, Melissa Coker founded the company. She used to be with Vogue. She was an editor, fashion editor with Vogue. She launched the company and it's all about kind of fashion, forward, funky, functional, kind of just really nice everyday wear. And she sells globally. She distributes globally. So her target audience is on one level business to consumer, but it's also business to business in terms that she's trying to expand her distribution network. That's a fairly large task when you take a look at, okay, media. What media do I buy to reach that global audience and specifically um, target in on them? So she took a budget of $1,500 and achieved views on video on um, YouTube of over 69 million in the first week. I think I checked back in on it. It's around 88 now. So what she did was this. She took 20 people, 20 of her friends, put them into couples. They didn't know each other. And she asked them to engage in the vulnerable act of a first kiss. Okay. A little bit scary, a little bit creepy, and she videoed it. Now, they were wearing red clothing. That's the only connection. The video at the very beginning shows Ren. Just in type at the top, that's it. There is no website. There is nothing that overtly pitches the company. Simply put, people watched it. They shared it. I believe there's a bit of voyeurism happening here. It's like, oh, okay, what does this look like? People wanted to share. They wanted to watch. So Hi. Hi. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Um, do we just do this anytime? Yeah. You ready? Yeah, take your time. We're ready. Oh. <laughs> Can you turn off the lights? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Justin. It is a bad How are you? Nice to Shall meet you. Shall we make out? Absolutely. <laughs> this, this here is the awkward moment. <laughs> Since you're an actress, you've done this before. And... A little bit, a little bit. Okay. I'll follow you. <laughs> Maybe that isn't the best way to kiss someone. Though. So whenever. Are you filming? I even forgot this his name. Pretty scary. <laughs> what was your name again? Greg. Greg. Ingrid. Ingrid. Yeah. Nice to meet you. So you get the idea. It goes from discomfort, vulnerability, and then right to the very end where it's actually humor, where they're actually, oh, you know, uh, you know, let's, you know, uh, what was your name? Uh, maybe we should go on a date. I mean, it was just, it was, it was beautiful because it was natural. 
these people didn't know each other. They were all kind of, she's networked into kind of artsy group of friends, right? So there were, you know, actresses, there were photographers, people who were kind of willing to kind of live on a bit of the edge on this thing. But it really tapped this emotion, that's a key part, vulnerability, and, and I call it the bit of voyeurism, okay? People wanted to see what happened. Now, results on this thing, okay? She had a budget of $1,500. She only spent $1,300. Okay, she came in under budget. She spent the $1,300 on catering, babysitting, and lighting. That's it. Now, what kind of results? 69 million views in the first week. Hits on her website were up 1,200%, of which over 90% were new visitors. Not bad. But here's the clincher. Sales were up 14,000 percent. Unbelievable. Now, some people, when they found out that this was kind of an ad parading as content, they, they, you know, she took a little bit of grief online, but because it wasn't a big budget thing, it wasn't produced by an ad agency, she was forgiven a lot. This was just kind of a quirky, edgy idea. She shared it initially with 21 of her friends on email. We can assume that those 20 people probably shared it as well. So it wasn't like it was big and seeded with, a, with an agency. This simply was pure viral spreading word of mouth. She gave them a story to tell. She positioned her brand. She got coverage. You can go on, you can see NBC. She got media out of this thing that would be worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars by the time it all was said and done. Okay. So trust and targeting, word of mouth, that's the big thing here, is understanding how to get people to share your content.